The Mad Moon, Stanley Graham and Weinbaum, Idiots, howled Grant Calthorpe. Fools knit with imbeciles. He sought wildly for some more expressive terms, failed and vented his exasperation in a vicious kick at the pile of rubbish on the ground, too vicious a kick, in fact. He had again forgotten the one-third normal gravitation of Io, and his whole body followed his kick in a long, twelve-foot arc. As he struck the ground the four loonies giggled. Their great, idiotic heads, looking like nothing so much as the comic faces painted on Sunday balloons for children, swayed in unison on their five-foot necks, as thin as Grant's wrist. Get out! He blazed, scrambling erect. Beat it, skidoo, scram. No chocolate. No candy. Not until you learn that I want fervor leaves, and not any junk you happen to grab. Clear out, the loonies loony jovis magni capites, or literally, big heads of Jupiter's moon backed away, giggling plaintively. Beyond doubt, they considered Grant fully as idiotic as he considered them, and were quite unable to understand the reasons for his anger. But they certainly realized that no candy was to be forthcoming, and their giggles took on a note of keen disappointment, so keen, indeed that the leader, after twisting his ridiculous blue face in an imbecilic grin at Grant, voiced a last wild giggle and dashed his head against a glittering stone bark tree. His companions casually picked up his body and moved off, with his head dragging behind them on its neck like a prisoner's ball on a chain. Grant brushed his hand across his forehead and turned wearily toward his stone bark log shack. A pair of tiny, glittering red eyes caught his attention, and a slinkamus sapien skipped his six-inch form across the threshold, bearing under his tiny, skinny arm what looked very much like Grant's clinical thermometer. Grant yelled angrily at the creature, seized a stone, and flung it vainly. At the edge of the brush, the slinker turned its rat-like, semi-human face toward him, squeaked its thin gibberish, shook a microscopic fist in man-like wrath, and vanished, its bat-like cowl of skin fluttering like a cloak. It looked, indeed, very much like a black rat wearing a cape. It had been a mistake, Grant knew, to throw the stone at it. Now the tiny fiends would never permit him any peace, and their diminutive size and pseudo-human intelligence made them infernally troublesome as enemies. Yet, neither that reflection nor the loonies' suicide troubled him particularly. He had witnessed instances like the latter too often, and besides, his head felt as if he were in for another siege of white fever. He entered the shack, closed the door, and stared down at his pet parkit. Oliver, he growled, you're a fine one. Why the devil don't you watch out for slinkers? What are you here for? The parkit rose on its single, powerful hind leg, clawing at his knees with its two forelegs. The red jack on the black queen, it observed placidly. Ten loonies make one half wit, Grant placed both statements easily. The first was, of course, an echo of his preceding evening's solitaire game, and the second of yesterday's session with the loonies. He grunted abstractedly and rubbed his aching head. White fever again, beyond doubt. He swallowed two fervent tablets and sank listlessly to the edge of his bunk, wondering whether this attack of Blarcher would culminate in delirium. He cursed himself for a fool for ever taking this job on Jupiter's third habitable moon, Io. The tiny world was a planet of madness, good for nothing except the production of fervor leaves, out of which earthly chemists made as many potent alkaloids as they once made from opium. Invaluable to medical science, of course, but what difference did that make to him? What difference, even, did the munificent salary make? if he got back to Earth a raving maniac after a year in the equatorial regions of Io. He swore bitterly that when the plane from Janopolis landed next month for his fervor, he'd go back to the polar city with it, even though his contract with Neil and Drug called for a full year, and he'd get no pay if he broke it. What good was money to a lunatic? The whole little planet was mad loonies, Parkets, slinkers and Grant Calthorpe all crazy. At least, anybody who ever ventured outside either of the two polar cities, Janopolis on the north and Heropolis on the south, was crazy. One could live there in safety from white fever. But anywhere below the twentieth parallel it was worse than the Cambodian jungles on earth. He amused himself by dreaming of earth. Just two years ago he had been happy there, known as a wealthy, popular sportsman. He had been just that too, before he was twenty-one he had hunted knife kite and threadworm on Titan, and triopes and unipt on Venus that had been before the gold crisis of 2110 had wiped out his fortune. And well, if he had to work, it had seemed logical to use his interplanetary experience as a means of livelihood. He had really been enthusiastic at the chance to associate himself with Neil and Drug. He had never been on Io before. This wild little world was no sportsman's paradise, with its idiotic loonies and wicked, intelligent, tiny slinkers, 
there wasn't anything worth hunting on the feverish little moon, bathed in warmth by the giant Jupiter only a quarter million miles away, if he had happened to visit it. He told himself ruefully. He'd never have taken the job, he had visualized Io as something like Titan, cold but clean. Instead it was as hot as the Venus Hollands because of its glowing primary, and subject to half a dozen different forms of steamy daylight Sunday, Jovian day, Jovian and Sunday, Europa light, and occasionally actual and dismal night. And most of these came in the course of Io's 42-hour revolution, to a mad succession of changing lights. He hated the dizzy days, the jungle, and idiot's hills stretching behind his shack. It was Jovian and Solar Day at the present moment, and that was the worst of all, because the distant sun added its modicum of heat to that of Jupiter. And to complete Grant's discomfort now was the prospect of a white fever attack. He swore as his head gave an additional twinge, and then swallowed another fervor in tablet. His supply of these was diminishing, he noticed. He'd have to remember to ask for some when the plane called no, he was going back with it. Oliver rubbed against his leg. Idiots, fools, nitwits, imbeciles remarked the parkett affectionately. Why did I have to go to that damn dance, huh? said Grant. He couldn't remember having said anything about a dance. It must, he decided, have been said during his last fever madness. Oliver creaked like the door, then giggled like a loony. It'll be all right, he assured Grant. Father is bound to come soon, father, echoed the man. His father had died fifteen years before. Where do you get that from, Oliver? It must be the fever observed Oliver placidly. You're a nice kitty, but I wish you had sense enough to know what you're saying. And I wish father would come. He finished with a suppressed gurgle that might have been a sob, Grant stared dizzily at him. He hadn't said any of those things. He was positive. The parkett must have heard them from somebody else somebody else. Where within five hundred miles was there anybody else, Oliver? He bellowed. Where do you hear that? Where do you hear it? The parkett backed away, startled. Further as idiots, fools, nitwits, imbeciles, he said anxiously. The red jack on the nice kitty, come here, roared Grant. Whose father? Where have you come here, you imp? He lunged at the creature. Oliver flexed his single hind leg and flung himself frantically to the cowl of the wood stove. It must be the fever, he squalled. No chocolate, he leapt like a three-legged flash for the flue opening. There came a sound of claws grating on metal, and then he had scrambled through. Grant followed him. His head ached from the effort, and with a still sane part of his mind he knew that the whole episode was doubtless white fever delirium, but he ploughed on. His progress was a nightmare. Loonies kept bobbing their long necks above the tall bleeding grass, their idiotic giggles and imbecilic faces adding to the general atmosphere of madness, wisps of fetid, fever-bearing vapours spouted up at every step on the spongy soil. Somewhere to his right a slinker squeaked and rejibbered, he knew that a tiny slinker village was over in that direction. For once he had glimpsed the neat little buildings, constructed of small, perfectly fitted stones like a miniature medieval town, complete to towers and battlements. It was said that there were even slinker wars, his head buzzed and whirled from the combined effects of fervorin and fever. It was an attack of Blarcher, right enough, and he realized that he was an imbecile, a loony, to wander thus away from his shack. He should be lying on his bunk, the fever was not serious, but more than one man had died on Io, in the delirium with its attendant hallucinations, he was delirious now. He knew it as soon as he saw Oliver, for Oliver was placidly regarding an attractive young lady in perfect evening dress of the style of the second decade of the twenty-second century. Very obviously that was a hallucination, since girls had no business in the Ionian tropics, and if by some wild chance one should appear there, she would certainly not choose formal garb. The hallucination had fever, apparently, for her face was pale with the whiteness that gave Blacho its name. Her grey eyes regarded him without surprise as he wound his way through the bleeding grass to her, good afternoon, evening, or morning, he remarked, giving a puzzled glance at Jupiter, which was rising, and the sun, which was setting. Or perhaps merely good day, Miss Lee Nealon, she gazed seriously at him. Do you know, she said, you're the first one of the illusions that I haven't recognized? All my friends have been around, but you're the first stranger. Or are you a stranger? You know my name but you ought to, of course being my own hallucination. We won't argue about which of us is the hallucination, he suggested. Let's do it this way. The one of us that disappears first is the illusion. Bet you five dollars you do, how could I collect? She said. I can't very well collect from my own dream, that is a problem. He frowned. My problem, of course, not yours. I know I'm real, how do you know my name? 
she demanded. Ah, he said. From intensive reading of the society sections of the newspapers brought by my supplely plane. As a matter of fact, I have one of your pictures cut out and pasted next to my bunk. That probably accounts for my seeing you now. I'd like to really meet you sometime, what a gallant remark for an apparition. She exclaimed. And who are you supposed to be? Why, I'm Grant Calthorpe. In fact, I work for your father, trading with the loonies for fervor, Grant Calthorpe, she echoed. She narrowed her fever-dulled eyes as if to bring him into better focus. Why, you are, her voice wavered for a moment, and she brushed her hand across her pale brow. Why should you pop out of my memories? It's strange. Three or four years ago, when I was a romantic schoolgirl and you the famous sportsman, I was madly in love with you. I had a whole book filled with your pictures Grant Calthorpe dressed in Parker for hunting threadworms on Titan Grant Calthorpe beside the giant eunuch he killed near the mountains of eternity. You're you really the pleasantest hallucination I've had so far. Delirium would be fun she pressed her hand to her brow again if one's head didn't take so. Gee, thought Grant, I wish that were true, that about the book. This is what psychology calls a wish-fulfillment dream. A drop of warm rain plopped on his neck. Got to get to bed, he said aloud. Rain's bad for Blarcher. Hope to see you next time I'm feverish, thank you, said Lee Nealon with dignity. It's quite mutual, he nodded, sending a twinge through his head. Here, Oliver, he said to the drowsing Parkett. Come on, that isn't Oliver, said Lee. It's Polly. It's kept me company for two days, and I've named it Polly, wrong gender muttered Grant. Anyway, it's my park at, Oliver. Aren't you Oliver? Hope to see you, said Oliver sleepily. It's Polly. Aren't you, Polly? Bet you five dollars, said the park at. He rose, stretched and loped off into the underbrush. It must be the fever, he observed as he vanished. It must be, agreed Grant. He turned away. Goodbye, miss or I might as well call you Lee, since you're not real. Goodbye, Lee, goodbye, Grant. But don't go that way. There's a slinker village over in the grass, no. It's over there, it's the, she insisted. I've been watching them build it. But they can't hurt you anyway, can they? Not even a slinker could hurt an apparition. Goodbye, Grant. She closed her eyes wearily. It was raining harder now. Grant pushed his way through the bleeding grass, whose red sap collected in bloody drops on his boots. He had to get back to his shack quickly before the white fever and its attendant delirium set him wandering utterly astray. He needed fervor in. Suddenly he stopped short. Directly before him the grass had been cleared away, and in the little clearing were the shoulder high towers and battlements of a slinker village a new one, for half-finished houses stood among the others, and hooded six-inch forms toiled over the stones, there was an outcry of squeaks and re-gibberish. He backed away, but a dozen tiny darts whizzed about him. One stuck like a toothpick in his boot, but none, luckily, scratched his skin, for they were undoubtedly poisoned. He moved more quickly, but all around in the thick, fleshy grasses were rustlings, squeakings, and incomprehensible imprecations, he circled away. Loonies kept popping their balloon heads over the vegetation, and now and again one giggled in pain as a slinker bit or stabbed it. Grant cut toward a group of the creatures, hoping to distract the tiny fiends in the grass, and a tall, purple-faced loony curved its long neck above him giggling and gesturing with its skinny fingers at a bundle under its arm, he ignored the thing, and veered toward his shack. He seemed to have eluded the slinkers, so he trudged doggedly on, for he needed a fervor in tablet badly. Yet, suddenly he came to a frowning halt, turned, and began to retrace his steps, it can't be so, he muttered. But she told me the truth about the slinker village. I didn't know it was there. Yet how could a hallucination tell me something I didn't know? Lee Nealon was sitting on a stone bark log exactly as he had left her with Oliver again at her side. Her eyes were closed, and two slinkers were cutting at the long skirt of her gown with tiny, glittering knives. Grant knew that they were always attracted by terrestrial textiles, apparently they were unable to duplicate the fascinating sheen of satin, though the fiends were infernally clever with their tiny hands. As he approached, they tore a strip from thigh to ankle, but the girl made no move. Grant shouted and the vicious little creatures mouthed unutterable curses at him, as they skittered away with their silken plunder, Lee Nealon opened her eyes. You again, she murmured vaguely. A moment ago it was father. Now it's you. Her pallor had increased, the white fever was running its course in her body, your father. Then that's where Oliver heard listen, Lee. I found the slinker village. I didn't know it was there, but I found it just as you said, 
Do you see what that means? We're both real, real? She said dully. There's a purple loony grinning over your shoulder. Make him go away. He makes me feel sick. He glanced around, true enough, the purple-faced loony was behind him. Look here, he said, seizing her arm. The feel of her smooth skin was added proof. You're coming to the shack for further in. He pulled her to her feet. Don't you understand? I'm real, no, you're not, she said dazedly, listen, Lee. I don't know how in the devil you got here or why, but I know Io hasn't driven me that crazy yet. You're real and I'm real. He shook her violently. I'm real. He shouted. Faint comprehension showed in her dazed eyes. Real? She whispered. Real. Oh, Lord. Then take me out of this mad place. She swayed, made a stubborn effort to control herself, then pitched forward against him. Of course, on Io her weight was negligible, less than a third earth normal. He swung her into his arms and set off toward the shack, keeping well away from both slinker settlements. Around him bobbed excited loonies, and now and again the purple-faced one, or another exactly like him, giggled and pointed and gestured. The rain had increased, and warm rivulets flowed down his neck, and to add to the madness, he blundered near a copse of stinging palms, and their barbed lashes stung painfully through his shirt. Those stings were virulent too, if one failed to disinfect them, indeed. It was largely the stinging palms that kept traders from gathering their own fervor instead of depending on the loonies. Behind the low rain clouds, the sun had set and it was ruddy Jupiter daylight, which lent a false flush to the cheeks of the unconscious Lenielin, making her still features very lovely. Perhaps he kept his eyes too steadily on her face, for suddenly Grant was among slinkers again, they were squeaking and sputtering, and the purple loony leapt in pain as teeth and darts pricked his legs. But, of course, loonies were immune to the poison. The tiny devils were around his feet now. He swore in a low voice and kicked vigorously, sending a rat-like form spinning fifty feet in the air. He had both automatic and flame pistol at his hip, but he could not use them for several reasons. First, using an automatic against the tiny hordes was much like firing into a swarm of mosquitoes. If the bullet killed one or two or a dozen, it made no appreciable impression on the remaining thousands. And as for the flame pistol, that was like using a big bertha to swat a fly. Its vast belch of fire would certainly incinerate all the slinkers in its immediate path, along with grass, trees, and loonies, but that again would make but little impress on the surviving hordes, and it meant laboriously recharging the pistol with another black diamond and another barrel. He had gas bulbs in the shack, but they were not available at the moment, and besides, he had no spare mask, and no chemist has yet succeeded in devising a gas that would kill slinkers without being also deadly to humans. And, finally, he couldn't use any weapon whatsoever right now, because he dared not drop Lee Nealon to free his hands, ahead was the clearing around the shack. The space was full of slinkers, but the shack itself was supposed to be slinker-proof, at least for reasonable lengths of time, since stone bark logs were very resistant to their tiny tools, but Grant perceived that a group of the diminutive devils were around the door, and suddenly he realized their intent. They had looped a cord of some sort over the knob, and were engaged now in twisting it, Grant yelled and broke into a run. While he was yet half a hundred feet distant, the door swung inward and the rabble of slinkers flowed into the shack. He dashed through the entrance. Within was turmoil. Little hooded shapes were cutting at the blankets on his bunk. His extra clothing, the sacks he hoped to fill with fervor leaves, and were pulling at the cooking utensils, or at any and all loose objects. He bellowed and kicked at the swarm. A wild chorus of squeaks and gibberish arose as the creatures skipped and dodged about him. The fiends were intelligent enough to realize that he could do nothing with his arms occupied by Lee Nealon. They skittered out of the way of his kicks, and while he threatened a group at the stove, another rabble tore at his blankets, in desperation he charged the bunk. He swept the girl's body across it to clear it, dropped her on it, and seized a grass broom he had made to facilitate his housekeeping. With wide strokes of its handle he attacked the slinkers, and the squeals were checkered by cries and whimpers of pain, a few broke for the door dragging whatever loot they had. He spun around in time to see half a dozen swarming around Lee Nealon, tearing at her clothing, at the wristwatch on her arm, at the satin evening pumps on her small feet. He roared a curse at them and battered them away, hoping that none had pricked her skin with virulent dagger or poisonous tooth. He began to win the skirmish. More of the creatures drew their black capes close about them and scurried over the threshold with their plunder. At last, with a burst of squeaks, the remainder, laden and empty-handed alike, broke and ran for safety, leaving a dozen furry, impish bodies slain or wounded. 
Grant swept these after the others with his erstwhile weapon, closed the door in the face of a loony that bobbed in the opening, latched it against any repetition of the slinker's trick, and stared in dismay about the plundered dwelling. Cans had been rolled or dragged away. Every loose object had been poured by the slinker's foul little hands, and Grant's clothes hung in ruins on their hooks against the wall. But the tiny robbers had not succeeded in opening the cabinet nor the table drawer, and there was food left. Six months of Ionian life had left him philosophical, he swore heartily, shrugged resignedly, and pulled his bottle of fervor in from the cabinet. His own spell of fever had vanished as suddenly and completely as Blarcher always does when treated, but the girl, lacking fervor in, was paper white and still. Grant glanced at the bottle, eight tablets remained, well, I can always chew fervor leaves, he muttered. That was less effective than the alkaloid itself, but it would serve, and Lee Nealon needed the tablets. He dissolved two of them in a glass of water, and lifted her head, she was not too inert to swallow, and he poured the solution between her pale lips, then arranged her as comfortably as he could. Her dress was a tattered silken ruin, and he covered her with a blanket that was no less a ruin. Then he disinfected his palm stings, pulled two chairs together, and sprawled across them to sleep. He started up at the sound of claws on the roof, but it was only Oliver, gingerly testing the flue to see if it were hot. In a moment the pocket scrambled through stretched himself, and remarked, I'm real and you're real, imagine that, grunted Grant sleepily, when he awoke it was Jupiter and Europa light, which meant he had slept about seven hours, since the brilliant little third moon was just rising. He rose and gazed at Lee Nealon, who was sleeping soundly with a tinge of color in her face that was not entirely due to the ruddy daylight. The blacher was passing, he dissolved two more tablets in water, then shook the girl's shoulder. Instantly her gray eyes opened, quite clear now, and she looked up at him without surprise, hello, Grant, she murmured, so it's you again, fever isn't so bad, after all, maybe I ought to let you stay feverish, he grinned, you say such nice things, wake up and drink this, Lee, she became suddenly aware of the shack's interior, why where is this, it looks real, it is, drink this fervor in, she obeyed, then lay back and stared at him perplexedly, real, she said, and you're real, I think I am, a rush of tears clouded her eyes. Then I'm out of that place? That horrible place, you certainly are. He saw signs of her relief becoming hysteria, and hastened to distract her. Would you mind telling me how you happened to be there and dressed for a party too? She controlled herself. I was dressed for a party. A party. A party in Heropolis. But I was in Janopolis, you see, I don't see. In the first place, what are you doing on Io, anyway? Every time I ever heard of you, it was in connection with New York or Paris society, she smiled. Then it wasn't all delirium, was it? You did say that you had one of my pictures oh, that one. She frowned at the print on the wall. Next time a news photographer wants to snap my picture, I'll remember not to grin like like a loony. But as to how I happened to be on Io, I came with father, who's looking over the possibilities of raising fervor on plantations instead of having to depend on traders and loonies. We've been here three months, and I've been terribly bored. I thought Tayo would be exciting, but it wasn't until recently. But what about that dance? How'd you manage to get here, a thousand miles from Janopolis? Well, she said slowly, it was terribly tiresome in Janopolis. No shows, no sport, nothing but an occasional dance. I got restless. When there were dances in Heropolis, I formed the habit of flying over there. It's only four or five hours in a fast plane, you know and last week or whatever it was I'd planned on flying down, and Harvey that's father's secretary was to take me. But at the last minute further needed him and forbade my flying alone, Grant felt a strong dislike for Harvey. Well? He asked, so I flew alone, she finished demurely, and cracked up, eh, I can fly as well as anybody, she retorted. It was just that I followed a different route, and suddenly there were mountains ahead, he nodded. The idiot's hills, he said. My supple plain detours 500 miles to avoid them. They're not high, but they stick right out above the atmosphere of this crazy planet. The air here is dense but shallow, I know that. I knew I couldn't fly above them, but I thought I could hurdle them. Work up full speed, you know, and then throw the plane upward. I had a closed plane, and gravitation is so weak here. And besides, I've seen it done several times, especially with a rocket-driven craft. The jets help to support the plane even after the wings are useless for lack of air, what a damn fool stunt! exclaimed Grant. Sure it can be done, but you have to be an expert to pull out of it when you hit the air on the other side. 
you hit fast, and there isn't much falling room, so I found out, said Lee ruefully. I almost pulled out, but not quite, and I hit in the middle of some stinging palms. I guess the crash dazed them, because I managed to get out before they started lashing around. But I couldn't reach my plane again, and it was I only remember two days of it but it was horrible, it must have been, he said gently, I knew that if I didn't eat or drink, I had a chance of avoiding white fever. The not eating wasn't so bad, but the not drinking well, I finally gave up and drank out of a brook. I didn't care what happened if I could have a few moments that weren't first tortured. And after that it's all confused and vague, you should have chewed fervor leaves, I didn't know that. I wouldn't have even known what they looked like, and besides, I kept expecting father to appear. He must be having a search made by now, he probably is, rejoined Grant ironically. Has it occurred to you that there are 13 million square miles of surface on Little Io? And that for all he knows, you might have crashed on any square mile of it? When you're flying from North Pole to South Pole, there isn't any shortest route. You can cross any point on the planet, her grey eyes started wide. But I, furthermore, said Grant, this is probably the last place a searching party would look. They wouldn't think anyone but a loony would try to hurdle idiots' hills, in which thesis I quite agree. So it looks very much, Lee Nealon, as if you're marooned here until my supple Lee plane gets here next month, but father will be crazy. He'll think I'm dead. He thinks that now, no doubt. But we can't she broke off, staring around the tiny shack's single room. After a moment she sighed resignedly, smiled, and said softly, Well, it might have been worse, Grant. I'll try to earn my keep, good. How do you feel, Lee, quite normal? I'll start right to work. She flung off the tattered blanket, sat up, and dropped her feet to the floor. I'll fix in good night. My dress. She snatched the blanket about her again. He grinned. We had a little run-in with the stinkers after you had passed out. They did for my spare wardrobe too, it's ruined. She wailed, would needle and thread help? They left that, at least, because it was in the table drawer. Why, I couldn't make a good swimming suit out of this. She retorted. Let me try one of yours. By dint of cutting, patching, and mending, she at last managed to piece one of Grant's suits to respectable proportions. She looked very lovely in shirt and trousers but he was troubled to note that a sudden pallor had overtaken her, it was the ribbleture, the second spell of fever that usually followed a severe or prolonged attack. His face was serious as he cupped two of his last four fervorin tablets in his hand, take these, he ordered. And we've got to get some fervor leaves somewhere. The plane took my supplely away last week, and I've had bad luck with my loonies ever since. They haven't brought me anything but weeds and rubbish. Lee puckered her lips at the bitterness of the drug, then closed her eyes against its momentary dizziness and nausea. Where can you find fervor? She asked. He shook his head perplexedly, glancing out at the setting mass of Jupiter, with its bands glowing creamy and brown, and the red spot boiling near the western edge. Close above it was a brilliant little disk of Europa. He frowned suddenly, glanced at his watch and then at the almanac on the inside of the cabinet door. It'll be Europa light in fifteen minutes, he muttered and true night in twenty-five the first true night in half a month. I wonder, he gazed thoughtfully at Lee's face. He knew where fervor grew. One dared not penetrate the jungle itself, where stinging palms and arrow vines and the deadly worms called toothers made such a venture sheer suicide for any creatures but loonies and slinkers. But he knew where fervor grew, in Io's rare true night even the clearing might be dangerous. Not merely from slinkers, either. He knew well enough that in the darkness creatures crept out of the jungle who otherwise remained in the eternal shadows of its depths to those, bullet-head frogs, and doubtless many unknown slimy, venomous, mysterious beings never seen by man. One heard stories in Heropolis and, but he had to get further, and he knew where it grew. Not even a loony would try to gather it there, but in the little gardens or farms around the tiny slinker towns, there was further growing, he switched on a light in the gathering dusk. I'm going outside a moment, he told Lee Nealon. If the blarcher starts coming back, take the other two tablets. Wouldn't hurt you to take him anyway. The slinkers got away with my thermometer, but if you get dizzy again, you take him, Grant. Where, I'll be back, he called, closing the door behind him. A loony, purple in the bluish Europa light, bobbed up with a long giggle. He waved the creature aside and set off on a cautious approach to the neighborhood of the slinker village the old one for the other could hardly have had time to cultivate its surrounding ground. He crept warily through the bleeding grass, but he knew his stealth was pure optimism. 
He was in exactly the position of a hundred-foot giant trying to approach a human city in secrecy a difficult matter even in the utter darkness of night. He reached the edge of the slinker clearing. Behind him, Europa, moving as fast as the second hand on his watch, plummeted toward the horizon. He paused in momentary surprise at the sight of the exquisite little town, a hundred feet away across the tiny square fields, with lights flickering in its hand-wide windows. He had not known that slinker culture included the use of lights, but there they were, tiny candles or perhaps diminutive oil lamps. He blinked in the darkness. The second of the ten-foot fields looked like it was further. He stooped low, crept out, and reached his hand for the fleshy, white leaves. And at that moment came a shrill giggle and the crackle of grass behind him. The loony. The idiotic purple loony. Squeaking shrieks sounded. He snatched a double handful of fervor, rose, and dashed toward the lighted window of his shack. He had no wish to face poisoned barbs or disease-bearing teeth, and the slinkers were certainly aroused. Their gibbering sounded in chorus, the ground looked black with them, he reached the shack, burst in, slammed and latched the door. Got it. He grinned. Let em rave outside now, they were raving. Their gibberish sounded like the creaking of worn machinery. Even Oliver opened his drowsy eyes to listen. It must be the fever, observed the parkert placidly. Lee was certainly no paler, the ribbleter was passing safely. Ugh! She said, listening to the tumult without. I've always hated rats, but slinkers are worse. All the shrewdness and viciousness of rats plus the intelligence of devils, well, said Grant thoughtfully, I don't see what they can do. They've had it in for me anyway, it sounds as if they're going off, said the girl, listening. The noise is fading, Grant peered out of the window. They're still around. They've just passed from swearing to planning, and I wish I knew what. Someday, if this crazy little planet ever becomes worth human occupation, there's going to be a showdown between humans and slinkers, well? They're not civilized enough to be really a serious obstacle, and they're so small, besides, but they learn, he said. They learn so quickly, and they breed like flies. Suppose they pick up the use of gas, or suppose they develop little rifles for their poisonous darts. That's possible, because they work in metals right now, and they know fire. That would put them practically on a par with man as far as offense goes, for what good are our giant cannons and rocket planes against six-inch slinkers? And to be just on even terms would be fatal, one slinker for one man would be a hell of a trade, Lee yawned. Well, it's not our problem. I'm hungry, Grant, good. That's a sign the blarches through with you. We'll eat and then sleep a while, for those five hours of darkness, but the slinkers? I don't see what they can do. They couldn't cut through stone bark walls in five hours, and anyway, Oliver would warn us if one managed to slip in somewhere. It was light when Grant awoke, and he stretched his cramped limbs painfully across his two chairs. Something had wakened him, but he didn't know just what. Oliver was pacing nervously beside him, and now looked anxiously up at him. I've had bad luck with my loonies, announced the parkett plaintively. You're a nice kitty, so are you, said Grant. Something had wakened him. But what, then he knew, for it came again the merest trembling of the stone bark floor. He frowned in puzzlement. Earthquakes. Not on Io, for the tiny sphere had lost its internal heat untold ages ago. Then what, comprehension dawned suddenly. He sprang to his feet with so wild a yell that Oliver scrambled sideways with an infernal babble. The startled Parkett leapt to the stove and vanished up the flue. His squall drifted faintly back, it must be the fever. Lee had started to a sitting position on the bunk, her grey eyes blinking sleepily, outside. He roared, pulling her to her feet. Get out. Quickly, wh what why, get out. He thrust her through the door, then spun to seize his belt and weapons, the bag of fervor leaves, a package of chocolate. The floor trembled again and he burst out of the door with a frantic leap to the side of the dazed girl, they've undermined it. He choked. The devil's undermined there, he had no time to say more. A corner of the shack suddenly subsided, the stone bark logs grated, and the whole structure collapsed like a child's house of blocks. The crash died into silence, and there was no motion save a lazy wisp of vapor, a few black, rat-like forms scurrying toward the grass, and a purple loony bobbing beyond the ruins, the dirty devils. He swore bitterly. The damn little black rats. There, a dart whistled so close that it grazed his ear and then twitched a lock of Lee's tousled brown hair. A chorus of squeaking sounded in the bleeding grass, come on. He cried. They're out to exterminate us this time. No this way. Toward the hills, 
there's less jungle this way, they could outrun the tiny slinkers easily enough. In a few moments they had lost the sound of squeaking voices, and they stopped to gaze ruefully back on the fallen dwelling. Now, he said miserably, we're both where you were to start with, oh, no. Lee looked up at him. We're together now, Grant. I'm not afraid, we'll manage, he said with a show of assurance. Well put up a temporary shack somehow. Wheel, a dart struck his boot with a sharp blurp. The slinkers had caught up to them. Again they ran toward Idiot's Hills. When at last they stopped, they could look down a long slope and far over the Ionian jungles. There was the ruined shack, and there, neatly checkered, the fields and towers of the nearest linker town. But they had scarcely caught their breath when gibbering and squeaking came out of the brush. They were being driven into Idiot's Hills, a region as unknown to man as the icy wastes of Pluto. It was as if the tiny fiends behind them had determined that this time their enemy, the giant trampler and despoiler of their fields, should be pursued to extinction. Weapons were useless. Grant could not even glimpse their pursuers, slipping like hooded rats through the vegetation. A bullet, even if chance sped it through a slinker's body, was futile, and his flame pistol, though its lightning stroke should incinerate tons of brush and bleeding grass, could no more than cut a narrow path through the horde of tormentors. The only weapons that might have availed, the gas bulbs, were lost in the ruins of the shack. Grant and Lee were forced upward. They had risen a thousand feet above the plain and the air was thinning. There was no jungle here, but only great stretches of bleeding grass, across which a few loonies were visible, bobbing their heads on their long necks, toward the peaks. Gasped Grant, now painfully short of breath. Perhaps we can stand rarer air than they. Lee was beyond answer. She panted doggedly along beside him as they plodded now over patches of bare rock. Before them were two low peaks, like the pillars of a gate. Glancing back, Grant caught a glimpse of tiny black forms on a clear area, and in sheer anger he fired a shot. A single slinker leapt convulsively, its gape flapping, but the rest flowed on. There must have been thousands of them, the peaks were closer, no more than a few hundred yards away. They were sheer, smooth, unscalable, between them, muttered Grant, the passage that separated them was bare and narrow. The twin peaks had been one in ages past, some forgotten volcanic convulsion had split them, leaving this slender canyon between, he slipped an arm about Lee, whose breath, from effort and altitude, was a series of rasping gasps. A bright dart tinkled on the rocks as they reached the opening, but looking back, Grant could see only a purple loony plodding upward, and a few more to his right. They raced down a straight fifty-foot passage that debouched suddenly into a sizable valley and there, thunderstruck for a moment, they paused, a city lay there. For a brief instant Grant thought they had burst upon a vast slinker metropolis, but the merest glance showed otherwise. This was no city of medieval blocks, but a poem in marble, classical in beauty, and of human or near-human proportions. White columns, glorious arches, pure curving domes, an architectural loveliness that might have been born on the Acropolis. It took a second look to discern that the city was dead, deserted, in ruins, even in her exhaustion, Lee felt its beauty. How how exquisite! She panted. One could almost forgive them for being slinkers. They won't forgive us for being human, he muttered. We'll have to make a stand somewhere. We'd better pick a building. But before they could move more than a few feet from the canyon mouth, a wild disturbance halted them. Grant whirled, and for a moment found himself actually paralyzed by amazement. The narrow canyon was filled with a gibbering horde of slinkers, like a nauseous, heaving black carpet. But they came no further than the valley end, for grinning, giggling, and bobbing, blocking the opening with tramping three-toed feet were four loonies, it was a battle. The slinkers were biting and stabbing at the miserable defenders, whose shrill keenings of pain were less giggles than shrieks. But with a determination and purpose utterly foreign to loonies, their clawed feet tramped methodically up and down, up and down, Grant exploded, I'll be damned. Then an idea struck him. Lee. They're packed in the canyon, the whole devil's brood of em, he rushed toward the opening. He thrust his flame pistol between the skinny legs of a loony aimed it straight along the canyon, and fired, inferno burst. The tiny diamond, giving up all its energy in one terrific blast, shot a jagged stream of fire that filled the canyon from wall to wall and vomited out beyond to cut a fan of fire through the bleeding grass of the slope, idiot's hills reverberated to the roar, and when the rain of debris settled, there was nothing in the canyon save a few bits of flesh and the head of an unfortunate loony, still bouncing and rolling, three of the loonies survived. A purple-faced one was pulling his arm, grinning and giggling in imbecile glee. 
He waved the thing aside and returned to the girl, thank goodness. He said. We're out of that, anyway, I wasn't afraid, Grant. Not with you. He smiled. Perhaps we can find a place here, he suggested. The fever ought to be less troublesome at this altitude. But say, this must have been the capital city of the whole Slinker race in ancient times. I can scarcely imagine those fiends creating an architecture as beautiful as this or as large. Why, these buildings are as colossal in proportion to Slinker size as the skyscrapers of New York to us. But so beautiful, said Lee softly, sweeping her eyes over the glory of the ruins. One might almost forgive Grant. Look at those, he followed the gesture. On the inner side of the canyon's portals were gigantic carvings. But the thing that set him staring in amazement was the subject of the portrayal. There, towering far up the cliff sides, were the figures, not of slinkers, but of loonies. Exquisitely carved, smiling rather than grinning, and smiling somehow sadly, regretfully, pitying me yet beyond doubt, loonies, good night. He whispered. Do you see, Lee? This must once have been a loony city. The steps, the doors, the buildings, all are on their scale of size. Somehow, sometime, they must have achieved civilization, and the loonies we know are the degenerate residue of a great race, and, put in Lee, the reason those four blocked the way when the slinkers tried to come through is that they still remember. Or probably they don't actually remember, but they have a tradition of past glories, or more likely still, just a superstitious feeling that this place is in some way sacred. They let us pass because, after all, we look more like loonies than like slinkers. But the amazing thing is that they still possess even that dim memory, because this city must have been in ruins for centuries. Or perhaps even for thousands of years, but to think that loonies could ever have had the intelligence to create a culture of their own, said Grant, waving away the purple one bobbing and giggling at his side. Suddenly he paused, turning a gaze of new respect on the creature. This one's been following me for days. All right, old chap, what is it? The purple one extended a sorely bedraggled bundle of bleeding grass and twigs, giggling idiotically. His ridiculous mouth twisted, his eyes popped in an agony of effort and mental concentration, can he? He giggled triumphantly. The imbecile. Flared Grant. Nitwit. Idiot. He broke off, then laughed. Never mind. I guess you deserve it. He tossed his package of chocolate to the three delighted loonies. Here's your candy. A scream from Lee startled him. She was waving her arms wildly, and over the crest of Idiot's Hills a rocket plane roared, circled, and nosed its way into the valley. The door opened. Oliver stalked gravely out, remarking casually, I'm real and you're real. A man followed the Parker two men, father. Screamed Lee. It was some time later that Gustavus Nealon turned to Grant. I can't thank you, he said. If there's ever any way I can show my appreciation for, there is. You can cancel my contract, oh. You work for me, I'm Grant Calthorpe, one of your traders, and I'm about sick of this crazy planet, of course, if you wish, said Neelan. If it's a question of pay, you can pay me for the six months I've worked, if you'd care to stay, said the older man, there won't be trading much longer. We've been able to grow further near the polar cities, and I prefer plantations to the uncertainties of relying on loonies. If you'd work out your year, we might be able to put you in charge of a plantation by the end of that time. Grant met Lee Neeland's grey eyes, and hesitated. Thanks, he said slowly. But I'm sick of it. He smiled at the girl, then turned back to her father. Would you mind telling me how you happened to find us? This is the most unlikely place on the planet, that's just the reason, said Neelan. When Lee didn't get back, I thought things over pretty carefully. At last I decided, knowing her as I did, to search the least likely places first. We tried the shores of the Fever Sea and then the White Desert, and finally Idiot's Hills. We spotted the ruins of a shack, and on the debris was this chap he indicated Oliver remarking that ten loonies make one half-wit. Well, the half-wit part sounded very much like a reference to my daughter, and we cruised about until the roar of your flame pistol attracted our attention, Lee pouted, then turned her serious grey eyes on Grant. Do you remember, she said softly, what I told you there in the jungle, I wouldn't even have mentioned that, he replied. I knew you were delirious. But perhaps I wasn't. Would companionship make it any easier to work out your year? I mean if for instance you were to fly back with us to Janopolis and return with our wife? Lee, he said huskily, you know what a difference that would make, though I can't understand why you'd ever dream of it, it must, suggested Oliver, be the fever, 